Um, so we've had um, three very um, committed uh, expressions of, of interest in financing projects in, in sub-Saharan Africa. So now we can turn to two people who are the happy recipients of some of those funds, or hope to be. Um, so I'll, I'll go to James next. Um, James Mario, who's the CEO of Centum. Um, James, tell us about what you're doing in Kenya and in East Africa in terms of crowding in, not crowding out, uh, other co-investors. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Centum is the largest investment company in, in East Africa. And our focus is exactly what has been addressed here, is about identifying that gap and focusing on developing opportunities and presenting investment grade opportunities of scale to, to investors. We're involved in a couple of sectors, but focusing specifically on power, we are currently working on, on three projects of varying scale. I'll start with the smallest. The smallest is a two megawatt solar power project, which is part of a captive project for a city that we're developing called Two Rivers. So Two Rivers is the offtake of, 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 of the solar power plant. The second one is a 70 megawatt geothermal power project. We have a 20 year power purchase agreement with the Kenya Power and Lighting Company. And the third one is a 960 megawatt coal power project with a 25 year power purchase agreement. This is the largest independent power project in the region. It is part of the Lapset corridor that you heard about uh, earlier. It's going to be the single largest generator of power in the country and it's the cheapest at 7.8 US cents per, per kilowatt hour and it's going to be baseload, baseload power to the grid. So to, to come to your question of what we are doing is we see our role as a developer and as an initiator of, of projects of scale. So if I take the, the Lamu power project as an example, you have four distinct stages of the project. You have the tendering stage, this particular project was competitively bid, and the bid was based on the basis, the award was on the basis of technical and financial proposal who offered the lowest tariff. We offered the lowest tariff. The second stage is the development stage up to financial close. Then you have the construction stage and the operational, the operational stage. Now, what we found from experience is that the majority of financial investors want to participate but they do not wish to take the tendering risk, they do not wish to take the development risk, they do not wish to take the construction risk. They want to come in and participate in an operational project. Now the conundrum is that you need the funding to get financial close, so how do you bridge the two? And, and the second thing we found is that in our market where we've had um, at least 12 or 13 IPPs over the last 18 years, there's been very few secondary transactions after, after, after financial close. So there's been no opportunity for pension funds to come in. So what, the way we've structured our project and the way we are currently working on it is that we've underwritten the financing all the way to financial close. We are, however, engaging with pension fund investors and other financial investors to invest by way of a convertible instrument where we draw down at financial close so that once we achieve the conditions precedent financial close, then we draw down. So that you as an investor, are not taking any development risk. So if you don't get financial close, there's no, there's, no, there's no drawdown of your investment. But then, the second risk is around construction. So during construction, three things can happen. The project can delay, the, the performance, mean it may not perform as expected, or the cost may escalate. And, and financial investors don't want to take that risk. So what you're doing to address that is then to allow them to convert into equity after the commercial operation start date. So the commercial operation start date is a point within the project when 90% of the output has been tested. So at that point, that particular investor is not taking a cost risk, is not taking a delay risk, is not taking an operational risk. And then they come in and become ordinary equity investors. So what that has done is that it has allowed us to be able to target investors as small as $100,000. Because they do not have to understand the, the ins and outs of our power purchase agreement and EPC contract and one m contract. They don't have to take site acquisition risks, uh, environmental risks, etc. The second issue has been the knowledge gap. You know, when you're talking 
to a financial investor and you want them to invest in, in, in infrastructure, there's a whole knowledge gap and understanding. Now, an investor does not want to spend $100,000 in due diligence costs to invest a million dollars. So the issue has been how do we democratize or how do we make the investment more accessible? So what we've done is, as part of the due diligence process, to help them is to get independent due diligence reports on areas of tax, financial, uh, technical, and legal. So that then you're not going into a data room and looking at power purchase agreements on them, looking at drawings. You're looking at a document that has been prepared independently that is fairly credible, and then it allows you to focus on your, on your due diligence areas. That has also reduced the period. And the final thing that we've done is tied to the point on capital markets. In our market, uh, there's an initiative around the development of asset-backed securities. <coughs> we've been engaging closely with the Kenyan Capital Markets Authority. And we are working on developing an asset-backed security which is going to be dollar-denominated once a project is complete. Because when you're holding the, the equity instrument, you're entitled to a stream of dollar cash flows. And that ABS, which we're now working on approval, then creates an exit for the financial investor who has come in. They then know down the road they can convert into an ABS, and that ABS gives them the liquidity that they desire. And you have insurance companies that want to create dollar-denominated liabilities, dollar-denominated education policies, etc. They now have a long-term dollar-denominated asset to play with. So that's what we are doing around the development, and those are the specific steps we've taken around crowding in investors who would otherwise not have access to infrastructure projects of this nature. Thank you very much, James. I think that's extremely interesting because it's, 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 it's illustrating the problem that many of us find in the sector, that on the one hand, the different risks uh, in the different phases of project development are, are not easily managed by the same investor. And on the other hand, those of us who pro project finance our projects, which is the way most, certainly most power projects are, are, are done nowadays, find that there are significant penalties attached to taking out the lenders at a you know, two years post construction because um, the lenders have got, done a lot of work, everybody acknowledges that, and they, they expect to be there for reaping the rewards of that work for a long time. So finding a mechanism so that they can be taken out and rewarded at the same time bringing in the pension funds and allowing those lenders to recycle their funds is a, project, a, a, a problem that many of us are, are struggling with. And I know that Andrew, who chaired the previous session, is working with FMO, uh, the Dutch Development Bank, to, to find a solution to that, to devise a solution um, to those different phases of the project development cycle. Doing business in Africa, you can't afford to be without Africa Investor.